Thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you to the RDO conference for the opportunity to um, speak um, at this conference today. Um, I come to you from the Ngumabada campus of James Cook University in far north Queensland, um, on the lands of the Iraganji and Jabakai people, and would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we uh, meet today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our hosts in Southeast Queensland and those of the lands of people who are joining um, in our um, session this morning. I would also particularly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of the Kwayo people on Malaita Solomon Islands in which we will be um, uh, engaging with today. Today will be quite a unique experience um, we are coming to you from both um, North Queensland, but also um, in Malaita, Solomon Islands. And so our presentation for this panel, we will be um, going backwards and forwards through the, the wonders of technology to be able to jointly present our um, session this morning between Malaita, Solomon Islands and far North Queensland. And we're being joined with people all around Australia and indeed around the world. So welcome. What we are going to talk today about a colonial era massacre, a reconciliation process that was needed, and how that was the foundation for ongoing sustainable development in Malaita, Solomon Islands. So for everyone who will know, Solomon Islands is a country in the Pacific to the northeast of Australia and to the east of Papua New Guinea. Today, we're going to talk about Malaita and indeed one of the language groups on Malaita, the language group of Poyo. This photograph was taken three years ago, literally three years ago, in July. It's a photograph of three people from Australia with chiefs from the tribes in Kwayo to reconcile, to reconcile our relationship that had been ruined, that had been a schism for 90 years. We were there to, as representatives of the people of Australia, Tim Flannery, the former Australian of the Year, Dr. Tyrone Lavery from the Australian National University and myself as representatives of Australia to meet with representatives of the Kwayo people to resolve something that had been between our peoples for 90 years. I'm going to hand over to Chief Esau Kekiobata to tell us a little bit about why our peoples had a problem for 90 years. Thank you very much. My name is Iso Kekeobata. My background education, one year, six months in school. I'm going to tell us the story about 1927. What happened in 1927? 1927, Colonial District Commissioner came to collect tax in Solomon Island. White, when the white man came, he forced people to work on the plantation and so forth. By doing that, there is no benefit for Koyo people in terms of education, health, and so on. Therefore, our tribal assassinate that person, and they did. So in retaliate of that, the British warship came to Koyo and opened fire and killed a number of people. And also sent army going up in the mountain from four corners of the island to searching people and killing people, raping women and girls burning houses and destroying tumble places and shrine areas. The innocent people are suffered and died. 
what a serious time in history for our people. So we start our work in 2016 with a white people again from Australian Museum and James Cook University. As we go along, our ancestors are angry and show us some sign that they don't want to work with the white people anymore. So we find out by definition. So we come together, organize the representative from the tribes. We come together and discuss about what we're gonna do about this issue. So we came to a plan to peace and reconciliation. So what we did, we do the consultation with the representative from Australian Museum and James Cook University to come and help us with the peace and reconciliation ceremony. We invite all government and other stakeholders also, we do the awareness program for 16 large villages in Iskoya and also 10 hamlet in the mountain. We also come to a provincial town in Aoki, in Malaita. And also we go to the capital city in Honiara to uh, do the awareness. Out of that awareness, we find out the data that we collected from that awareness, 95% of the Khoi people are really happy for the peace and reconciliation process to be done. Therefore, we organize the peace and reconciliation ceremony to happen according to the system of Khoi. So now I'll hand over to Dr. David McLaren to talk about the actual program during that day. Thank you very much, Dr. David McLaren. Thank you, Chief Esau. And so as Chief Esau has said, we were invited to be honest about the history, to be honest about the relationship between our peoples, which transcended us as individuals, but collectively our tribes. The people, the groups that we represented had never reconciled this terrible part of history. And so we were invited to walk into the mountains and to reconcile, to think forward about working together. This had been something that had been talked about for 90 years and had never been resolved. And so people walked from many villages and they waited not knowing whether this would be successful, not knowing whether spirits of the ancestors would actually be happy for this to progress. Old men came, they sat and they listened. Was there going to be a sign from the ancestors that the reconciliation process was going to be successful? We do not have photographs of what happened in the reconciliation process that day because it was in a sacred place, a taboo place, a shrine, where Chief Difaka called down the spirits of the ancestors and introduced us as representatives of Australia and that we were there to say sorry and to, to talk about walking together into the future. That process took many hours as dozens upon dozens of spirits of those ancestors who were killed indiscriminately 90 years ago were reintroduced to us. People sat and didn't know what was going to happen, but then word came through. There were some signs from the ancestors that they were happy, that they wanted this, they wanted to reconcile and move forward. What happened was people started to sing, people started to dance. 
we then came together into the meeting house and the relief was amazing. Those of us who had talked about this for many years were relieved. The ancestors wanted us to be able to reconcile the problems of the past and to think about moving to the future. The young men played music and thought about the relief that that represented. And so the next day where we were able to do this in a public place because the ancestors had then given us permission, the three of us Australians, representative of Australians gave three pigs representing the three tribes in Quayo that were affected. As a sense of reciprocity and our relationship, shell money, traditional shell money was given to us, which is now in the archives of the Australian Museum as a symbol of the reconciliation between our peoples. And so now we can think about working together. Chief Esau. Thank you. From here, we are quite a tribe. We decide to form a Barrow Conservation Alliance for moving forward. So now I'll hand over to Tommy Esau for our next presenter to talk about the Barrow Conservation Alliance. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Iso and David. Um, a very good morning and Usukan Lea from Malaita, Solomon Island. My name is Tommy Iso and I am the managing director of the Barrow Conservation Alliance. I would like to share with you how Baru is an alternative model for collaboration and partnership in Solomon Islands. What is Baru? Baru is a not-for-profit organization that approaches conservation in a holistic, collaborative, and cultural informed way. Baru is future-oriented, yet recognizes the importance of collective history. Baru is people-oriented, yet recognizes the natural environment is the foundation for human development that includes human health and well-being. Baru is grounded in quiet ways of life and spiritual practice. Over many years, Baru leaders and international collaborators had observed and participated in development activities implemented through government, non-government, church and commercial organizations. Top-down technical solutions implemented through these mechanisms of development were ineffective because government structures, NGOs, deliverables, church evangelism or commercial profit did not reflect the basis for life in Quayo a deep and abiding belonging to one's tribal land, tribal social connections, tribal history, and tribal traditions. Kwayo people's tribal belonging enables the sharing of collective knowledge of local fauna flora, social, spiritual, and ecological systems. Baru, uh, <clears throat> Baru is the coordinator of four tribal conservation areas in the Square region of the province of Malaita. These conservation areas are pristine rainforest on tribal customary land that had never had logging or large scale agriculture. There are many plants and animals in our conservation areas that are found nowhere else in the world. We are the tribal leaders from the mountains of Malaita, and we needed to use processes to work with other tribal leaders in a way that reflects our traditions and collective ways of life. 
To begin with, we got together with David and Michelle from James Cook University, who we had worked with for many years to plan how to structure Baro in a way that was culturally informed and where programs would benefit tribal people on tribal lands. We started by thinking about what had happened before, the peace and reconciliation process, and the future of our organization. We then created the Baru strategic plan. So you can see in Kwayo language, the purpose statement reads, Angurufingu tefo, from the Toor Leanga, Ikwayo, from the Ambilonga and the Wando and Dauru, Fufutanga, Mafalafala and Dauru, which means in English, the Baru Conservation Alliance actively and deliberately unites our people so that together we can live well in our place. We do this by purposefully caring for our collective land, our collective history our collective social connections and our collective traditions and ways of life. The basis for all Baru work is respect for tribal people and tribal land. All of our activities happen within tribal land and so one of the first things we needed to do was train conservation area ranges to map the boundaries of the four conservation areas. One of the Baru leaders, Mr. Masafi, who is sitting next to me here, Masafi has never been to formal school, but he's, he's amazing. He has trained more than a dozen conservation ranges in GPS mapping techniques. And Mr. Masafi works closely with tribal chiefs and leaders to ensure the tribal boundaries are identified and agreed upon by these leaders. Baru works with tribal groups in the four conservation areas to implement a number of community-based programs. This includes training local conservation ranges through a village health committee model to help diagnose and treat people living in the conservation areas who have TB. These are, there are no government schools in the Kwayo Mountains, so Baru has established grassroots cultural schools in its conservation areas. As you can see from the photos, the classrooms are thatch houses. Baru has also worked with male and female tribal leaders to design and construct culturally appropriate toilets and sanitation facilities. Baru also support conservation ranges in a range of reforestation and revegetation programs to rehabilitate land once used for slash and garden bird, uh, burn gardening. Baru has also worked with tribal people from one conservation area to implement a grasshopper farming project. Grasshopper are good food source and provide protein source for women and children. Recently, Baru has worked with tribal leaders to identify crops that grows well in different areas and will provide a sustainable and secure food source, taking into account changing weather patterns. Excess produce is able to be sold to support ongoing tribal activities. One of the Baru's unique projects having a major impact is the menstrual health and hygiene program. Baru is designing and making menstrual pads for women and girls in our local area, making a big difference to the life, to their lives. Dorothy will share more about this program in the next presentation. 
The Barrow Conservation Alliance is flipping the top-down process of development used previously in the Solomon Islands. Barrow works closely with a number of local, national, and international organizations. We primarily work in partnership with James Cook University. JCU provides technical and management support when engaging with donors and other overseas organizations, allowing Baru to focus on local activities. JCU help us with the formal reporting and financial systems required by funders, while Baru retains leadership of all local level priorities and activities. How has this work in practice in the current COVID-19 situation? I'll hand over to my JCU colleague, Dr. Karen Chia, to explain more about it. Thank you, Tommy. We at JCU are being led by Varu on the best way to support local level initiatives. With COVID-19 disruptions, especially travel connections, for us, connectivity is crucial. The computers in the Baru office are linked to the JCU server and supported by JCU IT staff. JCU funded a solar system to power independent internet connection that enables us to communicate 24 seven, regardless of geographical distance. And we are using this connectivity today to present with our Baru colleagues in the Solomon Islands. Baru leads JCU in formal management meetings every Thursday via Zoom. And we work as a team, each doing our bit, supporting the overall work of Baru, informed by the Baru tribal model. Outside of formal meetings, we collaborate using email, Zoom, and Facebook Messenger on our mobiles is very useful when Baru members are working in remote communities. However, this is not without some challenges. Solomon Islands receives a lot of rain and we face periodic connection issues. And if there are weeks and weeks of rain, the solar system at the Baru base cannot sufficiently charge the batteries. Connectivity issues also mean Baru members may be offline when working in mountainous regions out of line of sight with satellite towers. But Baru is investigating innovative ways to meet these challenges, including portable solar and satellite options and hybrid mains and solar power at the Baru base. Together, Baru and JCU embrace diversity, cultural ways of engagement and working in partnership for sustainable development through traditional and contemporary means. Post COVID, we are very much looking forward to once again being able to meet in person and continue to learn from one another. Two of the priorities identified by Baru are women's leadership and the need for a gendered lens across all Baru programs. So now it's my pleasure to hand over to Dorothy and Michelle to share more about Baru's menstrual health and hygiene program and how Baru is engaging with women in tribal communities. Thank you, Karen, and good morning to everybody. Um, Jiri Nura Ogada, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm joining you from, the Iriganji and the Jabakai peoples, I acknowledge the elders past and present and pay my respects. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our team of um, people from Solomon Islands, from Malaita and Choisel, and also from Australia, New South Wales and Queensland, who are working um, on this menstrual health and hygiene project that we're talking about this morning. I'm going to hand over to our leader, Secretary of the Barrier Conservation Alliance and Power Mary, Ms. Dorothy Esau. Thank you, Michelle. And good morning, everyone. Why we started? My name is Dorothy Iso, and my background education 
is nine years at school. Every morning I used to walk to work. One day I meet a young girl coming back from school at 10 a.m. I ask her, why are you coming back from school? Because it's not the right time to come back. And she answered, I'm menstruating. And we continue to talk. She raised up some feelings and told me about the area around her school. First, she say she hasn't got any money to buy pants and she haven't got any proper parts to use. That's why blood stain on her skirt. When the other students saw the stain, they laughed at her. So she was afraid and go back home. Also, the school haven't got any bathroom to help her change her pad and to wash her body for her privacy. When I hear these stories from this young girl, I think back to how I also experience this kind of situation. That's why I make up my mind to work on this menstrual program to help students at to help students at our school in East Choir. So that is can help student girls to attend school and its model for East Choir schools to help them with their health by using clean parts. This presentation is the story of how I'm working in East Quayo with my family and community to improve menstrual health of young women and girls. What we did, we talked with partners from Australia and plan to find a way to help girls like the, store, like the one in my story. James Cook University partners gave us some money to buy two sewing machines and pay my niece to sew reusable parts. We look at the patterns for parts and we talk with the friends from Calico Stavery in Solomon Island and we try different patterns. We then ask our daughters, sisters and niece to try the parts we have sewn and get their feedback. We use material we could buy in Honiara or Aoki. Plus we get some waterproofing material sent from Australia. Once we were happy with the parts, we talk with the teachers and principal at two local schools. We wanted to understand more about what happened for the girls when they have their men's. We interviewed 34 girls at two schools and we give out five parts each to over 120 girls. We have, we have to make a lot of parts. Later, we went back to ask the girls what was good and what wasn't good about the parts. What we learned. The girls like using the new parts. The girls told us they feel stress and or shame when they have their mens because the blood gets on their clothes. Another girl says they were happy as they think bad blood comes out of their body. There are no toilets at schools. Most girls say they did not go to school when they have their mens. Washing and drying the pad, pads was hard. There was nowhere private to wash and dry the pads. And blood and mens are a taboo in Christian villages. We also learned girls needed 
parts in different sizes and thickness, depending on their age and time in their menstrual cycle. Aunties, cousin and sister sometimes use the parts given to the girls. And this means the girls ask for more parts. And our next steps. We also work with women in the choir mountain who do not wear pants. We are now trialing different patterns of part with women and girls in the mountain. Similar to the traditional cabilato belt, we were around our waist. We are learning a lot and we are doing it our tribal land, tribal ways. Thank you everyone. Now I'm handed to uh, my colleague, Dr. Um, Michelle McLaren. Thank you. I'll let abide Doro. So to the theme of our conference, how are we disrupting? We're disrupting by Koyo tribal leadership, flipping the power patterns, Baru Conservation Alliance is leading and we here in Australia are supporting. We are the bridge to funding and other resources, but they are our leaders. We are also showing great respect for girls who are not always valued in modern Solomon Islands. And we're especially evaluating, evaluating, sorry, valuing their education. We're making education more possible through this work. We're challenging the priorities of people in villages. Through the work of Baru, there is promotion of the importance of wash facilities and including menstrual health and hygiene in the curriculum. There's been some changes there where we are having doctors and nurses helping to deliver that curriculum so that male teachers can feel more comfortable. We're using cultural models. So as Dora has just said, the Cabalato uh, style pads are being explored so that women can manage their flow when they go into the Bisi, the menstrual hut um, in the mountains. We're also evaluating and skill developing through the development of masks, as you can see there, in preparation for COVID. So there has been a lot of changes. I'm going to finish our presentation uh, with a story through poem. Dorothy started with her story of what started this work and I'm going to finish with the story of girls. I, young girl, sit at the mercy of a moon guided current, discarded fashion stem a scarlet stream. I rise stay small, hiding in full view in a room with no walls, flying curtains for doors. Nowhere to wash my tide, I wait for the moon to roost. With the darkness, I move to a cleansing source, curious cousins giggle while shame clutches my throat, all constricted but the unwelcome flow. I, young student, sit on my bag, protect the chair, from being stained, just don't move. Some girls go home, backache, no cloth, no games, uncomfortable, dizzy, unnoticed. The toilet has no water, it is blocked. I try the teachers, prefer the bush. Boys tease, evil spirits peep holes in the wall, afraid of ghosts, no lock. Girls issues, tabu tabu, male teachers shame, mocked by students, awkward. I go home. I, Mother Bissy, once held you in repose. A weak, sheltered chatter and ancestral laughter. Now I am empty, my bench is bare, you too alone, surrounded by prayer. My daughter, the mouth of this river will one day gush new life. The stain you now fear is your future power. March to Moon's Pulse with your sisters, your mothers, aunts and cousins and prevail as we always have. I'll now hand over to Chief Esau to wrap up. Thank you once again, everyone for listening. Thank you organizer for giving us time to share. Any question, any comments? Thank you very much.
So um, we now would like to invite any questions. I'm going to start by looking in the chat box in the Q&A. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to monitor that while we're presenting. Um, but I'll just go back and have a quick look. If you would like to speak, please um, pop your camera and microphone on. We'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, hear Annie that you've joined us from Malaita. It's really excellent to see that you've um, been able to join us. Thank you. And um, thank you very much, Regina, for your um, feedback on the poem. Is there any other questions? We've got uh, two, one from Regina. I'll just read this out um, unless you want to speak to us, Regina. Um, thanks for the important presentation. Wondering whether Baru had to address any land ownership issues, which can be contested in other places in Solomon Islands, creating difficulties for collective action. So Chief Esau, I might hand to you to talk about whether there was land ownership concerns while you were doing this important work. Question. Oh, yeah. What is the question? Okay, so maybe I ask you. Question him, what time you follow work on the man What time you follow land boundary? Any problem along him or something have come up where making him hard a little bit for working work for you? Oh, yes. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, to be honest, uh, through this process, it takes us a lot of consultation uh, during the process. Uh, but because we uh, talk with the leaders and uh, the tribal leaders and the owner of the uh, tribe, um, <clears throat> that's why they are the one that forefront and work with us uh, through the through the leaders of the tribe, and we manage to uh, uh, to achieve that, and everybody is happy. Uh, it's take a long time, like two or three months, for consultation. But at the end of the day, every we like. Uh, running um, consensus system. So everybody, when end of the day, everybody are happy. And before we do the mapping. Later, later. Um, thank you. We have another question from Kieran Sims, who's asking, thanking us for the work. Could you please comment briefly on storytelling as a means to unsettle or disrupt the prevailing growth centric and techno rationalist discourses? Man, stuck a big word, Moya. <laughs> how can how does storytelling allow us to think about development in an innovative way? Let's think about that question and any examples. So, um, how does storytelling allow us to think about development in innovative ways? And I think small, you know, community-sized ways. And can you provide any examples? So, by me hand, Golabaru. Baru, someone from maybe Chief Isa or Tommy or Doro. I think um, in in our culture, um, I think um, story storytelling is how we we pass different informations, and our stories have attached to many of like our culture and nation, and like our surroundings, and so it has a powerful way of of, of sharing the values of who we are. And how we do things and so i think story is is one of the good way of um communicating um and making like changes telling about telling us um what we do and who we are and also solving uh challenges yeah and also again like uh in 1927 issue is even is uh 92 years ago but it's like a story that my granny told my father and my father told me and I was like a story that happened yesterday. Uh, so that story is, is like a, some of our young people make us like a traumatized and also stressed about that story. So that is why we want to do, take some initiative forward to sort out that problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think um, Dave will just make a response also. Yeah, no, thank you, Kieran and everyone. Really, really important that we utilize those models and so as Karen presented every Thursday we sit on Zoom for many many hours and we tell stories to each other to try and understand what the issues are. Those stories are sometimes use of metaphor, sometimes the use of old ancient stories to understand a situation now or to think about a solution for a particular issue, whether that be sanitation or whether that be education or whether that be um, resolving tribal boundaries for land. 
And so the use of story is something that we embrace um, and that we learn from as a real strength in the way that we work together. Thank you. Um, we have another question. I might ask um, Dorothy, you might be able to respond to this if you would like. Can you comment on the role of women in the awareness? So maybe think about different projects and how what the role of women has been in awareness raising. Okay, um, uh, on our awareness, because uh, in our country or like a Solomon or Kwayo especially, uh, men look like women, women not, um, they look down on them. But now we, uh, we, we say that uh, we put women high to lead the women's. So when we go, when we do awareness at schools and also communities, um, we work together. We didn't find any, any problem along the line. The, uh, the community or the schools we work with are happy with our work and we work together and also with the hospital. Thank you, Doro. Thank you. And I was thinking about the way that you started the work with the schools, how you started with the senior women as a senior woman yourself and started at, with women talking to women who then led the process and, in, and brought the men into the process. So it was truly woman led. Yeah, thank you. We have um, just a little bit more time and a couple of other questions. So um, we have a question that says, do you have any recriminations to some groups who lose their traditional and culture recently to bring it back? Do you have any recriminations? recriminations maybe? Oh, maybe it's recommendations rather than recriminations. So maybe let's go with that. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations to groups who lose their traditional tradition and culture recently to bring it back? How can they bring back culture and tradition? Any recommendations from yes. the Baru? Thank you, Thomas. Um, I think um, there are a few groups um, in Inquire and also Malate as well, who also um, started to, to lose their culture. And um, they, they're coming to us um, to ask some of the advice that how we can work together to help revive the importance of culture. And so, um, we are also working with um, the Mayama Senior Greenbelt, uh, who is also an, another initiative in Malaita, to work together and support um, cultural schools in, in Malaita. And uh, also we're thinking of um, organizing like um, uh, cultural schools in the area. We are also working on um, documentation of traditional knowledge, and we have um, um, document um, a book, a bilingual book about Kwai culture uh, and, and English. And so that's, we want to do that in, in education and also promoting um, culture in our areas. And we also wanted to work with, with, with other tribal groups as well. Uh, to encourage them um, to continue to value their culture and also the environment. Um, and that's what we, what we are doing, yeah. Thanks, Tommy. And um, you have kind of answered part of the next question, which is do um, you collect and preserve traditional stories too? And that you've started to speak about the role of the Koyo archive. I'm just wondering if you just want to give a little bit more information about what was happening there, who you're working with and how that's hap happening for you. Yes, thank you. Um, the other work that we, we are doing um, at the moment is what we call the Choir Archive. And the Choir Archive is, um, is collecting and like preserving a lot of uh, our histories and our stories um, in the past, who has been done by um, Dr. Roger Kissing and David Aiken and uh, they have collected a lot of histories in the past um, who have set us like you know a basis um, but now the work of the archive is now quite led and um, we are uh, leading this project 
because we know it is really important uh, the work that we are doing because it is like um, a community archive that that we put all our our information inside like before this kind of work usually stays in universities and govern, run, run by government but we realized it that this information are important for us and so at the moment we in our prior archive um, we have about half a million documents, digitized documents in our archive, and it's a living archive. And it is it is um, like a deposit that we, most of the research work that we do, our photos and everything that we do is stored in this, this fire archive. And we are working with uh, James Cook University and also University of Michigan, Dr. David Akin, to help us with the work and many of our colleagues that we're working together. And we are also connecting with the National um, Archive and Museum in Solomon Island. Thank you. The, uh, the second question for there was, uh, are other Malay tribal groups adopting a similar model? And I know that you've been working with the RERI crew with the Greenbelt Initiative. So maybe just speak to that briefly before we go on to the next question. Yes, so um, at the moment, we are working with um, the, another network, the Mai Masina Greenbelt, who is also leading the similar work uh, the similar model that is a tribal led. And so the Mai Masina Green Belt is having about 30 plus groups who are working closely and we're working together on um, achieving like, you know, the sustainable development model that will help our future generation. Yeah, but then again, uh, in, our, in our own area, like in this square, about another 18 more tribe calling us to come and help them to, uh, uh, from the organization and uh, help them in, a, in their communities, in their own tribe. So it's a very, very big work. Mm, a growing work. Yeah. Mm. Um, another question here is, are there any aspects of culture that you have had to let go to enable this integrated model to work? So has there been some things you've had to let go so that the work that you're doing can go ahead? Any aspects of culture, or have you been able to use your own culture and hold it strong while still doing this important work? Definitely, uh, for our for our organisation, we put culture as a priority for our organisation, and we encourage them because, like in the past, um, I like a colonial thinking, um, and the idea from our child they come and influ influence us. So that is why we are, we are here, we are on land. We need to do something here and then we can work together with other colleagues. So culture, that is the priority for us because it's very, very good for us to help and to maintain our culture for our future generation as well. Thank you, Iso. Um, so is, I'm just think we've, I'm conscious we're nearly out of time, but um, if you do have a question, you can raise your hand and um, our fabulous IT support people will turn on your microphone so that you can ask. So does anyone that's joining us have a question they'd like to raise their hand and ask before we finish up? I can't actually see. So if you can just turn your microphone on if the IT person can raise your hand, has um, seen a raised hand. Yes, just you have to click the raise hand button that's at the bottom of the screen. Oh, and if you, you do that, um, I'll be able to turn on your microphone. So that's anyone in the audience, if you would like to speak or make any comments, just click the raise hand button and I'll turn on your microphone. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we have any other questions, but maybe I could just hand to Chief Esau. Would you like to just do a wrap up and say say a few words in finishing? Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for listening and thank you for your time. Uh, because this uh, conference is about developing research, developing our uh, our ways and our so. What we like to share with everybody this morning is that we are developing ourselves and also we share with other 
friendship barrel. We call a friendship barrel. So we develop and we share together and we work together and we can see the outcome is the very good outcome for our community, not for our own community again, but also for our childers. Uh, so this is the message that we want to share with you uh, this morning. So thank you one and all. Thank you very much. We've had quite a few thank yous coming in through the chat as well. So Bella um, Abaita, which means a big, very big thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, we really appreciated you being interested in our story. If you would like to contact us, um, feel free to look at Baru Conservation Alliance online. It's, there's a Facebook group. You're most welcome to follow and join and to contact Tommy there, or you can contact um, one of us here at James Cook University just by looking up our names um, and you'll find us. Um, thank you, uh, the um, RDI team, again, for accepting our panel um, uh, submission, and we're just grateful for the opportunity to share this story. We'll say thank you and hope to see you all in a different session soon. <laughs>